Hey guys, it's Nick the Booksmith. Welcome back, welcome back. Have you ever been so inspired that you leapt face first into a project with all the hopes and dreams of greatness like a first grader making his first macaroni necklace only for it to all implode into a disastrous failure that left you scratching your head wondering where you went wrong? Yep, me too. Today's video is all about avoiding mistakes mess ups, oopsies, and we'll count off some essential pointers that were literal game changers when I finally did learn them. All right, paper grain. Did you know that just like wood, most paper also has a grain? When paper is made, cellulose fibers are extracted, usually from some sort of plant material, and that is turned into a pulp, which is then pumped out onto a mesh belt and fed into a roller. Well, this belt encourages the fibers to lay in one direction or another, and this direction is called the grain. Grain direction might not be critical to know in every circumstance, but in book binding, it can be crucial. If the paper making up the book pages will be folded into signatures like a sewn binding, you may want to consider finding the grain of the paper and fold those papers with the grain. And you might ask why? Why, why would you wanna do that? Why does it matter? Well, folding with the grain reduces the strain that the folding process inflicts on the paper. Let's take this little example sample. Example sample? These are little strips of paper that I have trimmed and then taped together in a flat piece. Now let's say this is the grain of the paper, that it's running north to south, head to tail. And let's say this is just a regular piece of paper and you want to fold this paper to make a signature. Well, if you fold this paper in, you know, somewhere in the half, I guess, and you're folding it with the grain, then it's gonna fold pretty easily. However, let's say you take this same piece of paper and you fold it in half the other way against the grain. As you might notice, there are small cracks and breaks in these little pieces of paper. It might not be a big deal today, but the more that the book is used and these papers are turned and folded and unfolded, all these little fibers are going to be more and more broken, more and more stressed. Does that make sense? Now, if you're just making a simple little notebook that's just going to be used for taking lists and then you're just gonna throw it away, it's not gonna matter that much. It's still gonna last you some time and it's not like it's just gonna fall apart because you fold across the grain. However, if you are going to be using this book or reading this book, whatever it is, for any length of time, you can see how folding across the grain like that is a slippery slope to your paper failing and breaking out of its binding. And that's why I say, if you can help it, fold with the grain and not against it. I'm going to link a video below this one that goes into more detail and shows a simple way to test and determine the grain of some paper. Okay, number two, this is a big one. Maybe you've made a book before and your cover's warped. Maybe you're using some chipboard from a notebook or some mat board, a file folder, whatever it was, and after you were done making it, those boards warped. Most beginners, whether they're junk journal makers or traditional book binders, they're gonna run into this issue. It's pretty much inevitable until you understand the process that's going on. Let's look at an example. We'll pretend that these two pieces of light chipboard are your book covers. To one side of the chipboard, I'm brushing on an even coat of PVA, you know, white glue. I'm taking care not to leave any dry spots and I'm also taking care not to let the glue pool in any area or another. I want a nice, even coverage of glue. Then I'm going to apply a piece of designer paper to each of these boards. And pro tip, going back to our previous topic of grain direction, I'm making sure that the grain direction of the paper matches the grain direction of these chipboards. 
On one of these pieces of chipboard, I'm going to brush another even coat of PVA and adhere another piece of paper on the opposite side. Then I'm gonna let them both dry. These are the boards once they have dried. As you can see, this chipboard is the one where paper was only added to one side and let to dry. And you might be able to notice a definite curl or warp to this board. It's created by the pull of the paper I glued on as it dried because the moisture from the glue expanded the fibers both in the board and the paper and then when the glue dries, those fibers shrink and it pulls the chipboard with it. And that's what results in the warp. But if we take a look at the other sample where there was a piece of paper glued onto both sides, is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, perfect. It's a very thin chipboard, which is hard to get perfect. But there was an equal amount of glue and paper applied to both sides of this chipboard. So the pull was evened out as both sides dried and the result is a much more flat board. Now a pro tip, a couple of crucial points is to use the same type of glue on both sides. Glues will have varying amounts of moisture and strength. And if you want to even the pull and get the flattest board possible, it's best to use equal amounts of the same adhesive. In a practical application, we can look at this book. This is a Oliver Twist that I rebound. And what you'll see is that when I made the cover, the leather and the marbled paper was glued onto the outside of the cover. Then when I inserted the book block, the end papers were used to glue to the inside of this cover. So that's where you find the glue on both sides of your book board. And as you can see, this book has very flat covers. If your covers cup in just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit, that is perfectly acceptable. But that's how you get your even covers, whether you're traditional book binding or you're making a junk journal, your book covers are going to be covered usually with something, unless you start off with a book board material that you just love and you're gonna leave uncovered. Another tip is to take care when you are adding your adhesive and you're going to put on a cover material to not leave any spots without any glue or even spots where maybe that's where you brushed your glue on first, but it's already started to dry. If the entire surface isn't nice and evenly wet when you put your cover material on, you're gonna be left with a bubble wherever you left a dry spot without any glue or perhaps a place where the glue was already drying. And that's where those bubbles form, especially if you go on to, let's say you're gonna cover this in Mod Podge or matte medium or an artist's varnish you're gonna brush that on, the moisture from whatever you're going to seal it with will expand those fibers where that bubble is because that bubble doesn't have any adhesive sticking it down to the board. It doesn't have any support underneath. And you may not have seen the bubble until you went to seal it with the sealer. And then as soon as you paint on that wet sealer that expands the fibers where it's not adhered to the board securely, and that's when it swells up and it leaves it all loosey-goosey. So just a little pro tip there. Trimming corners. When you trim your corners, when you're gonna be folding over your book cover material over your boards, you want to trim away some of the material in the corner. If you cut away too much of the material, when you go to fold over the corners, you're gonna end up with a gap where there's not enough cover material to fold over that corner. But on the other hand, if you leave too much material, then when you fold it over, you might end up with a bunchy, bulky mess in the corners. Neither one of those are optimal. <laughs> Under this video, I will link a video that goes over cutting corners in more detail and shows you how to make a measuring jig on how to cut those corners. Okay. 
How about your sewing thread? Sometimes you'll run into a problem if you use thread that is too thick for sewing your book together. Traditionally, waxed linen thread is used in book binding. Waxed linen is a very strong material, and because it's waxed linen, then that helps with lessening the friction of the thread on the paper as you sew it. If you use a thread, this is a small twine or hefty thread, if you use something that is hefty and thick like this, that is going to contribute to the excess bulk in the swell of the spine. The swell is the additional thickness in the signature folds that is caused by the sewing thread. When you fold up your signatures and you sew them together, whatever you sew them together with is going to add additional bulk to those folds. The bigger the thread, the bigger the swell. I do suggest waxed linen, but there are other alternatives, especially if you can't get waxed linen. Sometimes it can be really pricey because you can only find it in bookbinding suppliers, uh, websites, and that kind of thing. Alternatively, um, you can use something like upholstery thread. It is thin, but it is very strong. If you're making miniature teeny tiny books, then maybe use something that is adjustable. And by that, I mean something like embroidery floss. Embroidery floss is a thread that has six strands all woven together. And you can separate these strands into as many as you'd like. When I'm sewing together just a standard regular sized book, I usually separate these into three and three. So I use three of these strands together in a needle to sew together my signatures. If you take some beeswax and after you separate out, let's say three of these strands, you can run it through this beeswax. And not only does that help your strands stick together into one, but it also acts a lot like that waxed linen thread and the cotton fibers will lay flat now and they won't be catching on your paper as you sew your signatures together. And lastly, I think a trap that uh, a lot of us have fallen into at one time or another, whether it's with book binding or anything else, is thinking that expensive tools are required. But don't let a budget or lack of access to tools keep you from bookbinding. I'm going to show you a simple list of things to gather to start your first project. You will need some kind of pokey tool or awl. And this is for poking holes in your signatures so that you can sew them together. This is actually an ice pick. You will need some kind of knife. This one is an Ulfa brand. It's the Ulfa Cutting Silver. It is my favorite craft knife. I highly, highly recommend them. I think the quality of the handle is superb. It is made out of stainless steel, and so it is very sturdy. It's not going to crack on you like the cheap plastic craft knives. And the replacement blades are very affordable. You will also need some kind of a straight edge. I recommend a metal straight edge as opposed to some kind of plastic or resin. It has the inch increments on the front and metric on the back. You can probably get away without a folder, but I do recommend finding a folder of some kind, whether it's bone or Teflon, whatever it is that you like. These are great for not only folding and creasing paper, but also scoring. Of course, some scissors, which most people already have anyway. You don't use them a lot in book binding, but you'll need something to cut your sewing thread. You'll also need some needles. You'll need some needles. I just have a few sizes in here that I typically use. Bigger needles when I'm sewing together a bigger book and smaller needles for smaller books. And then it's always helpful if you can get it to have a curved needle. And these are great if you're gonna do any Coptic binding or anything like that. Definitely not totally necessary, but it's a nice option to have if you can find one. You will need some kind of brush for glue. So when you are gluing your cover material on or gluing down your end pages, you'll definitely need some kind of brush. 
And then finally, you'll need something heavy for pressing your book. This is just a standard brick from the Home Improvement Store that I covered with gift wrap and then shipping tape. You could also get some hardboard and some hand clamps and you can use something like this to clamp your book between while it dries to give it that same press. Okay, well, I guess that is it. Just a list of things that when we all begin something like bookbinding, just some things that we may or may not even think about, but they end up being really important later. Some of you may have been binding for a long time and have full knowledge of that list of things, but some of you who are beginners, maybe these are some things that you hadn't thought about. And if anything, if I can help you avoid a problem or at least understand the process a little bit, maybe that'll help your projects go a little smoother. Well, I guess that is it for this one. I hope you enjoyed this video and I really, really appreciate you hanging out with me. As far as the miniature house goes, there are some photos that are listed on Patreon, some sneak peeks. So go check those out if you are a Patreon member. If not, I will be uploading a video soon that's going to show the progress, so no worries. Today's comment shout out goes out to Dash of Dave, who says, are you banned from every coffee shop for single-handedly depleting their coffee stirrer sticks? Joking aside, I feel inspired. You started me on my content creation journey with ephemera and journal inspiration. Now I'm itching to make some miniatures, which I haven't done for a very long time. Thank you for being you. And thank you, Dash of Dave, for being you. But I hope everybody has an excellent weekend. And I will see you all really, really soon in the next video. Bye, guys.